Hello, everyone. My name is Langston Clark, and I'm the founder and organizer of Entrepreneurial Appetite, a series of events designed to build community, promote intellectualism, and support Black businesses. And I'm just proud to be continuing our special series on Black folks in the outdoors who are adventurers, activists, and entrepreneurs. And today, we are having a conversation with Brittany Coleman. Now, Brittany, I can't remember how I met you. Did I first meet you? I know I met you once on one of the, the BIPOC calls, right? Yes, definitely it was the BIPOC calls. But did mm-hmm. I did you go to the um outdoor retailer event in Denver? Were you there? I did go to outdoor retailer. Um, not this past year though. I went the year before last. Okay. And then a couple years before that, but yeah. Right. Maybe so, were you at that one? Mm-mm, no, my first one was Denver. So the first oh, time okay. I did meet you was during the um the BIPOC outdoors mm-hmm. uh group so okay because i'm new to this to the community of folks who are into the outdoors and whatnot so yeah yeah it's like i met no, some yeah around at the same time so it was like mm-hmm. i didn't know who I, I interacted with before and whatnot so or at what yeah. time yeah no it was definitely actually i'm remembering it now because it was definitely one of the um bipoc and biz calls because i remember somebody made a comment about I think you made a comment about like embracing the world, the word outdoorsy and somebody was like trying to hype you up. Um, I, I feel like that was what happened. But Maybe that was, it was definitely that. <laughs> it, 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 it was, it was definitely that. So um, mm-hmm. it's good to, to, to have this one-on-one conversation with you. And what's interesting is, is that I know I had, I had met you the first time there. But as I was going through folks for this special series that we're doing on Black folks in the outdoors, someone mentioned your name again. I was like, oh, let me hit up um, <laughs> look and um, get your story behind Tough Cutie. But before we do that, can you just tell your story about becoming an outdoors woman? Was this something you grew up with, something that's recent for you? How, to, how did you get to, in the out, to being in the outdoors? Yeah, so it was kind of a weird accident, I'll have to say, because... I, growing up, like the idea of being outdoorsy or an outdoors person or woman was not part of like my vernacular was not part of the way that I grew up. Um, And yet I was always very active as a child. Mm. Like I could not wait to get outside, always running around like, you know, 100 miles a minute, um, tomboy climbing trees, like doing all of these things. But it was never, you know, in the way that I understand sort of outdoorsy to be today as as an industry. And so, you know, I had a career in um, just sort of apparel, retail technology, all of these things, and had the opportunity to work for um, an outdoor brand leading the SOC um, division for this brand. And that was probably my biggest intro into the outdoor industry, like as an industry, as a business and economic force, um, really having the opportunity to manage that brand. Um, And unfortunately, as it were, um, you know, there was some sexist behavior Mm. towards women. Um, There was this idea that she was, the consumer was just the girlfriend of the real outdoorsman. She didn't need like functional clothes. She didn't Mm. need like to be thought of outside of just the sort of this generic like trink and pink way of thinking. So I'm just going to basically take a man's product, make it smaller, make it pink, um, and then sell it to women. And something about that, like just didn't sit right with me, with my morals, with my ethics. And so that was like my introduction back into like the outdoor industry. Um, And then I, I think I just, through learning about all of the initiatives to promote diversity, um, which is always something that's been important to me in whatever realm, like business, the actual, like exploring the outdoors and, and, um, you know, reclaiming, I guess, the relationship with nature. Um, just became more important the more I learned about it and the more I decided I wanted to have a business that really meant something to people. Um, and so all of this has just come as a part of, of wanting Tough Cutie to be something for voices that are not really recognized in this space. Yeah. So, so what came first? Was it, was it you had this job with this retailer in the outdoors mm-hmm. and you were running the sock division? That's so interesting. I yeah. didn't know they had divisions <laughs> like that, right? They got a division yep. for hats and all, all that stuff. So, and so, all that. Mm-hmm. so did, did, did that career 
opportunity push you to being in the outdoors in ways beyond what what I consider just to be yeah. play. Um, mm -hmm. mm, so what was your first big, other than like going outside to play, like when we typically think about just being in the outdoors, like hiking, mountain yeah. climbing, whatever, what was your first experience like that? Yeah, I mean... I will say, and this came about even just talking to other other Blacks in the space about our experience in claiming the term outdoorsy, like I will say that growing up, I had some really unique experiences. So like I, I grew up in Las Vegas, we would, we would do field trips to places like, you know, Red Rock. Um, I was actually baptized in Zion um, as part of my church. It was like a mm. whole big deal, but it was just you know, I didn't think about it until until later, having sort of rejoined this industry. But, you know, I, I also I have had some of my, I guess, most interesting and maybe monumental outdoors experiences actually really recently. Um, so I've started volunteering with the uh, Texas Outdoor Family in partnership with um, a, an organization called Black Women Who Kayak. I did that for a little while. Um, and then recently had the opportunity to hike the enchantments with another organization and actually just came back from a 21 day, uh, backpacking trip, which is my first one of that, of that length. <laughs> so it's quite a, quite a long time. So, so yeah, let's, let's talk about, let's talk about the backpacking trip before mm -hmm. we get into the story of tough cutie. So what, yeah. what is, cause to me, like, that's like, I don't know if I could do 21 days. <laughs> I, I can, yeah. I can, but I, I have, I'm not, I'm not there yet. So what is the experience yeah. of like backpacking for 21 days? Yeah. So like we, I will say that there was a good ramp up to where we were sort of, before we were doing 100% primitive camping, um, just with, you know, your tents and anything you can carry on your back really. So we did a, a part in a yurt, um, which is, I don't know if you've ever seen kind of a yurt. It's sort of like a fancy-ish tent. It's not like a, it's not like an apartment. There's not like walls in the same way that you would have, um, I guess, in a normal structure. But it's this kind of circular mm. structure with a tent on the top. You can kind of okay. think of it like that. And there were bunks, but no electricity, no running water. So we started that way, um, and then slowly transitioned into like a full backpacking experience. Um, and it was wild, I have to say. Like it was you come to really appreciate like the simplicity of modern technology. Yeah. And we even had things that people way back when didn't have, right? Like we had a stove, um, you know, that you could light uh, with, we could carry the gas with us and, and set it up. And, um, you know, we had water filtration systems that we carried and used. Um, but yeah, I would say like coming out of that, I was just like really humbled about just, how easy it is to exist um, outside of the back country, really. Yeah, yeah. So let's let's talk about Tough Cutie. And you had mentioned before your experience with the way sexism manifested in your previous job. And it's interesting, when you first said that, I was like, somebody said the wrong thing or made a comment. <laughs> but it was, this is like a structural thing in right. the culture of of the way the industry yeah. or the company you were working in operated. And so mm -hmm. talk about how you're how you're leveraging your own entrepreneurial spirit through Tough Cutie to like address address those types of issues with sexism and whatnot. Yeah. So when I left, I I knew that I it wasn't going to be enough just to make a, another product, like another sock that was just, you know, made however and I could just put my name on it and say like it's women owned which it is but I really wanted to kind of go a step beyond that and make a, a larger statement about what it means to invest in women kind of across the value chain and so um, I found a factory that was also women owned as well as 70 percent women run um, and it's all made in the United States and fourth generation so they've been around a long time and it's mm. just and you know a lot of they're certified women owned and that was really important to me because because of the fact that from an agency standpoint, I mean, I had no agency like in the other company I worked for, right? Like I mm -hmm. couldn't make any decisions. I wasn't invited to these meetings. Like I'm, I mean, I'm like 24, 25, like, no, who's, who's listening to like the, you know, <laughs> the 24 year old with these like ideals and, um, you know, feeling like she wants to save the world and, ha you know, the things should be a certain way. Like, 
that's not really how the world works unfortunately like you just you work within the structures that that you have and and so I knew that I wanted to create a new one um and that I wanted women to be core to more than just like serving women in our marketing um but also just in every aspect of how we operate I wanted there to be more more umph I guess and that it was that no one could say we weren't like legitimate and had integrity in in our belief system yeah so it seems like that that you were thinking about this in terms of an entrepreneurial ecosystem that that women operated in I want to know about this factory I want to know about this factory so (laughs) how did you find this factory like where's the factory located is this a bunch yeah. of, in my mind, it's a bunch of hippie white women <laughs> who got together in the seventies and were like, we're going to do this during the feminist movement, but maybe, maybe I'm wrong. So, so what, no, what's the, what's the so, issue behind the factory? Yeah. So the factory, it's a family owned factory. So the same family has owned it for, um, God, like a hundred years. Mm. Um, but, but the women are, it's three sisters and they own it now and they run it. And they employ, you know, other women, they employ men too, some really fantastic men that I've, I've had the pleasure of working with who are really great. Um, but it's just three sisters who um, also believed in supporting other women. Like they're also a certified women-owned business. Mm-hmm. Um, and th- I think that just from a value standpoint, it happened, I was really lucky, I'd say that, that women were able to take hold of their family business at a time when I was really looking to partner with other women. Yeah. So I had, I had a conversation with a few, few of the folks who have been, um, who've been part of this series Mm -hmm. and a lot, a lot of people in the outdoor industry, a lot of black folk in the outdoor industry has started nonprofits Mm -hmm. and talk about your decision to becoming for-profit versus nonprofit. Was it, was there ever like a, a debate in your mind about that was a, a strategic move to be more because I'm assuming that you're for profit to, yes. to be for profit rather than nonprofit. What was what was the decision making process behind that? Yeah, so I think a lot of that had to do with kind of how I grew up. Um, I worked in nonprofits and other parts of my career. I mm. mean, um, I worked as a college advisor, um, helping like low income first gen students um, get access to scholarships and get into colleges. Um, and so I, I had a good sense of what the nonprofit world was like um, and both the the impact and also some of the limitations of that mm. particular particular model right in terms of reach and I I always felt like I wanted to to you know because of how I grew up you know I grew up single mom like at times we were like sporadically homeless and we didn't always have you know food or even just like basic resources and that was part of the reason why I think I work for nonprofits was because for me like education has been the reason that you know my life is how it is that I'm able to um that even had a corporate job, I'd say, to, to begin yeah. with, that was problematic, but I had one. Um, but I think I realized that at some point I wanted to be the one to be like giving the other opportunities to other people as opposed yeah. to being the one like asking. And that is part of part of running a nonprofit game is kind of always being willing to ask for help and kind of needing it because you don't you don't have the resources. Um, necessarily and so I I think I just wanted part of the agency piece of it for me personally was like my own agency in my own life and like being into in a position where I wasn't having to ask or be reliant mm-hmm. on other people that I could really just you know rely on myself and then be in a position to give back to others that's pivotal yeah so <laughs> the reason why the reason why I ask is because um, I teach at a university. And I'll never forget, this was maybe a year ago. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we did this thing. It was a group of students, um, student org event. People were talking about what they want to do when they graduate. And everybody's like, and this is a group of Black students. They're like, I want to start a nonprofit. I want to start a nonprofit. I want to start a nonprofit. They're like, I want to go work this place. And I want to start a nonprofit. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, man, everybody want to start a nonprofit? Who wants to start their own business? And mm-hmm. I think that there's, there's a narrative and there's a shift that we need to go through about 
that we don't learn that when you start a nonprofit, you are literally always asking people for money and for support. Money. Yeah. And think about what that does to your agency. Think about what that does to how you operate in the mm -hmm. society, always being the one to ask and not yeah. being the producer and the one that has the opportunity to give. And so I think yeah. it's outstanding that that's, that's the mental shift that you were able to make through your experiences uh, with, with nonprofits. How, how you know, I, I love that. I'm um, sorry. I love that you said that because I think that probably the reason that a lot of those people felt like they also needed to start their own nonprofits is because they might've been beneficiaries of mm. programs yeah. that helped them. That was certainly the case for me. And I remember thinking like when I graduated, when I graduated from college, um, I almost felt like kind of guilty, mm. like not, not doing, not that I didn't want to also give back, but it was also like, you know, you you've been gifted so much in your life. Like so many people, whether you saw it and were aware of it, or it was just like people you had no idea, but like, we're watching out for you. Um, like, how could you not give back? You know, like this is your time to, to support others and to, to do it. And really that was the primary model that I saw. Like I hadn't even been exposed necessarily to like big corporate models or just like, you know, typical business jobs, um, so much of what I saw was other nonprofits because um, those are the programs that that helped me. Um, and so I think that there's there might also be some level of like, I mean, I, I don't know, guilt or obligation or feeling like, you know, mm. how could you be selfish if you don't, if you don't give back in this way? Like if you go pursue this corporate job or make this money, like who are you to to do that and so yeah. I, I think that's also just like a larger conversation about you know money and like people feeling like they can have it and who can't have it and who can't like but yeah that was definitely a big mental shift for me over time is like realizing that I even though nonprofits or you know donors whoever like gave to me it didn't mean that I couldn't then go out and like try to make my own money and like be self-sufficient yeah I think I think what's missing in our community is like a broader conversation about philanthropy and mm -hmm. how do you how do you become a philanthropist? Because I, I think we we've had we know about nonprofits. I think now with like earn your leisure mm -hmm. and like Instagram and TikTok, social media have really gotten people more and more aware of starting their own businesses, the whole real estate thing. Yeah. But I think the next part of the conversations we're having about money in black communities is the power of philanthropy in a way that it moves policy and uplifts mm -hmm. communities. And I would really be interested to see what happens with Tough Cutie in the future as you think about building the business, but what what are the ways in which you want to start giving back? And so mm -hmm. how old is Tough Cutie? And yeah, so and we're technically three years old, but we we struggle for a little bit. I'm not even going to lie. So we just started selling officially this year. Okay. Mm -hmm. Definitely got things in a point where we could go to market with, with them. Um, part of that was the fact that, you know, to, to do what I said I was going to do, which is partner with women owned businesses in the USA to make a premium quality product takes a lot more capital than I had on ran, mm -hmm. like tens of thousands of dollars. And so figuring that whole thing out um, took a little while. So let's, we're going to come back to that. So let's, so you're in year three. Yeah. So let's fast forward 22 years. You're in year 25, right? Mm -hmm. And Tough Cutie is doing amazing things. It's one of the most popular outdoor brands for women and yeah. girls. Mm -hmm. how, how do you see yourself evolving as a philanthropist? Like what, what vision do you have in terms of your give back through, through your business? Yeah. I mean, I think. Uh, at that point, we should have money to be on the same level as like, like a keen, you know, which has given up, which has given back like, I think $25 million mm. since, since they've been around. And I don't even think they've been around that long, maybe 25 years, maybe less, yeah. like I don't, it should be less than that. But, you know, if I, if, if I had the success that you're saying, and it's 25 years later, like, we would have been able to significantly like shift the narrative around like what it means to be like, a woman in the outdoors yeah. and that is 
as well as a woman in business, because those are our two yeah. core things. Like I am, if you look at kind of our website and the imagery I put forth, I show myself as like somebody who is participating in like outdoor activities, but also like a very strong businesswoman, because yeah. those are the two things that, that really matter for me. Um, and I think that, I think that we'll see a lot more diversity in terms of women feeling like they have space they don't have to take space like they just have it like you don't yeah. even we're not even having these conversations yeah. about like taking up space in the outdoor industry and like yada 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 like it just it just is like it's not yeah. it's not uncommon right to see that and i and i would hope that my brand was a part of of kind of paving the way for that because you know even on the trips i went on it was there were some uncomfortable moments that yeah. were directly related to just maybe a lack of I don't know, just like maybe cultural awareness or just the fact that um, just there wasn't as much experience with with non-traditional people occupying these spaces. So. Yeah. So so let's talk about the transition, right? So you mm -hmm. talked about leaving your job. You talk about you're in yeah. year three now. There's a lot more capital that you needed to get to the point where you could work with women-owned businesses and get Absolutely. your product made and sold, <laughs> all of that stuff. So what yeah. was the transition like from corporate America to entrepreneur and like, how are you paying your bills? Like, how are you, how are you, how are you making it yeah. happen? No. So yeah, I was off quote unquote off work, um, out of the corporate world for about nine months. And I was doing full, tough cutie full time. And in that time we landed some really substantial, um, retail deals that will mm. be some of which are out there now. Like you can go shop a couple of our partners, like Dick Sporting Goods, it's, Public Land, Title IX, um, a couple other ones that are coming out soon um, in 2023. But yeah, it's uh, the business is not in a place where I can not also have another job. So I actually, I'm you know I'm working another job as well um, while I still figure out Tough Cutie because that's just the reality. Yeah. Um, you got to pay your bills. Like I don't know how much you know about the retail cash conversion cycle, but it's it's a long one, you know, uh, we'll just say like retailers make a, make a purchase, but it could be like 60 to 90 days before they pay you. Um, and oh, they might wow. reorder and you might have stuff coming in, but yeah, it's, there's a lag, uh, between when you sell your product and when you get paid for it. Um, and there's a lag too, between because normally you have to buy the product from the vendor with money up front, find retailers to buy it. They buy it and then they pay you, like I said, 60 to 90 days later. Um, so we're navigating that and figuring all that out. We're also selling online, which there's no, there's not a big cash um, conversion cycle there, but it's hard. Like yeah. it's just a grind. It just is. Yeah, yeah. It is until it's not. That's right. And so, you know, what's interesting. Another thing that, that, that that we talk about a lot in terms of diversity and inclusion in entrepreneurship for black folk mm -hmm. is like we don't have access to venture capital right or angel mm -hmm. investors and so sometimes we just got to be our own angel investor you know sometimes your main job yeah, yeah. is your venture capitalist because it's paying you your salary and you mm -hmm. live your budget and then you you make it happen in your side hustle that you want to be your main hustle one day and so yeah. Um, that, that's, a, that's an awesome strategy for you becoming your own independent business. And I'm wondering how have you been able to balance that work as an entrepreneur, but then also as an employee? Yeah. So it gets tricky. I won't lie. Um, I use this little thing called send later, <laughs> which allows me to, to, you know, seem present but just using technology to kind of just close the gaps between like my actual availability mm -hmm. and like when, when I'm sending out communications to people and, you know, it's a lot of nights, a lot of weekends and a lot of being super organized. Um, luckily when I was working on my, my business full time, um, I was able to just kind of get a lot of stuff done, put some systems and processes in place so that I could be as systematic as possible when I had less time, which is now, um, and then fortunately having the support of a couple of really great programs and communities who yeah. honestly have just like been able to help me out when I couldn't do something myself. So I want to talk about that. How have you mm -hmm. been able to find 
Black community in the outdoors? Yeah, you know, there aren't that many. <laughs> I will say, it. I mean, there's not a lot. Um, and so uh, some of it's word of mouth. Some of it, you know, I live in Austin and so it's an even smaller pool um, of people. But I, I mentioned, you know, I was involved for a while in a group called Black Women Who Kayak. Um, and they're doing some really fantastic things about creating space for women in the outdoors. Um, the networks that you and I met in is mm -hmm. another way. Um, and then, I don't know, it's just sort of meeting people and kind of feeling some immediate connection. Yeah. Um, that's about it, honestly. I have, a, I have online a lot of, a lot of awesome um, I don't call them influencers, but they are, I guess, influencers that I follow who also just like give me a lot of inspiration and make me feel like connected to them, even if I don't know them, like yeah. just by the experiences they share. And so when we think about community, I think the way that people are purchasing and supporting businesses, they're they're doing it in terms of community, right? So what I see in terms of like you talking about LinkedIn and influencers, these influencers are building followers, building community, yeah. and like Discord chats that are separate from their LinkedIn posts or their Instagram posts or their mm -hmm. uh, Twitter posts or whatever. And so how can the community of listeners that we have for this podcast support what you're doing? Like, where can they go to buy the products? I know mm -hmm. you mentioned exporting goods, but like, where are you on social media? What's the website that they can go to to like, buy what it is that you're offering now is it only socks you got other apparel too or socks like right now we just have socks yeah okay. right now is the main thing we have um like a merino wool hiking crew that goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with you know the big brands who've been in the space for a long time so like darn tough smart wool farm to feed those guys um so half before like a really awesome product that we're really proud of and for people who want to buy it they can just go to um toughqd.com and um the other retailers that I mentioned also have them in their stores. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. And um, and then follow us on Instagram at Tough Kitty right. Brand. Like that is a great space. We uh, just did a series of um, blog post style interviews with a few um, black women who were able to just share what their various, very different experiences. And that was one of the things I was super excited about because a lot of people perceive us as a monolith. Um, but these are very three very different black women who had three very different experiences um, in different age groups. And so it was excited to put forth their stories. So you can find those on subqd.com as well. Um, and yeah, those are the those are the big places you can find us. So I don't want this to be a curveball question, but it <laughs> might be because I, di I didn't tell you this before. So normally the way the way the podcast started, we started off as a book club. And so we would have an author mm -hmm. and an entrepreneur. Uh, in conversation so what 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 books are you reading oh, when no. you're in the outdoors connected with nature <laughs> honestly I'm not even reading nature books like when I'm out there like this last book this last actually I did borrow a book while I was out there um by Isabel Allende mm. and I didn't get to finish it because it wasn't my book but it was called, um, what is this one that she let me borrow? A Long Petal of the Sea. Mm. Um, and so I was happy to support like another like Latina author in that sense. Um, but when I was out there, I think I wasn't really, I didn't bring a lot of books with me on either trek um, because I was really trying to focus on just like taking in the yeah. moment. And honestly, there's a lot, to be distracted by just in the natural space and like a, the books, I feel like I have those anytime. All right. It was so, a little bit of a curveball question. I'm not gonna lie, but yeah, that's I it. Know, my bad. Yeah. <laughs> but you you responded okay. though. You stepped up to the plate. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, Brittany, any last words? Anything that you want to add about Tough Cutie or your journey uh, in the outdoors and business for the audience? Um, I think. I just hope that like other black women, whether they're entrepreneurs or people just who are experimenting this space can like be inspired by the fact that I've, 
that I found community and I found support and people who really understand because, you know, it could be easy to get deterred and to feel like no one gets it, that your voice isn't really being heard, you know, especially if you're going into these spaces with people that you might not know well, because maybe mm -hmm. your friend group doesn't traditionally do these types of things. So you might end up with people that you don't know who might yeah. not yeah. kind of get get your energy or just like get your communication style or, you know, whatever it is. Um, just to like be encouraged and to, to, to not be afraid to like find these communities, whether it's online or following on tough cutie or whatever it is, and just find the people who get you because we, we are out here and it's, it's not enough to just let the beauty and the, the peace that can come with experiencing these spaces like pass you by because you maybe you did it with the wrong people mm. um and that has that's happened to me where i was like oh my god there's no way like this i'm not sure this was right <laughs> and i own an outdoor brand and i and i'm saying like oh like I, <laughs> I don't know how that didn't really leave me feeling good i wasn't i wasn't prepared um but just to to like give it another chance and to try to find the, the, the people who do see you because they're, they're out there, like we are out there. And that's what I hope my brand will be. Like, I hope people will find comfort in, you know, in the fact that you can, you don't have to change yourself or your relationship, like to have a good relationship with nature. Like you don't have yeah. to do it the way that you see people who aren't people of color doing it or have the things that they have or like just like you don't have to do it like them like don't do it like them do it like you like whatever that is however that comes together because if you try to do it like them like it's it's not authentic in either yeah. direction so i would say just like as hard as it can feel like you might feel pressure to change and do something a way that doesn't feel right to you like Try to resist that because probably your way is going to be more interesting and better. So just do that. <laughs> Yo, the way that you answered that question got me thinking. Okay, so I remember when when Usher's second album came out, My Way. Mm -hmm. My Way mm -hmm. is Usher's second album. It's not his first. He had like a little boy album. But when My Way <laughs> came out, Usher was wearing the big old ski goggles, turned to the side, <laughs> big old bubble yeah. ski jacket. And mm -hmm. everybody was wearing like mm -hmm. that type of gear. And it was a fashion yeah. statement. And so yeah. to your point, it's like, we don't have to be like everybody else is in the outdoors. And you, know. and you, you don't have to do what I did. Which yeah. Go to spend 21 days out there, which I will even say like, that was a manifestation of like my own imposter syndrome with the industry. And like, feeling mm. like, oh my God, I, I got something to prove. Like if I'm like, it's not enough. It should have been enough that I saw something wrong with this industry and like went to the lanes I went to to do something about it and deliver a better product. Like I should have been more confident in just that alone and saying, you know, no, I didn't, you know, climb Mount Everest, but I did stand up for women who were being treated badly in this industry. And I deserve a space here. Like I didn't have to go out there and just like be out there for that amount of time. Um, I could have just done what I was normally doing, like going on hikes on the weekends or doing smaller trips or just like, you know. So anyway, my point is like, don't feel like, don't do what I did. Don't feel like you have to. Ooh, wait, wait, <laughs> wait, 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 <laughs> wait. Now I know, now I know it's your story, but I just, I just want to, I want to push back on the don't do what I did. And I say that because after, when you reflect back on those 21 days, I think you got more out of it than just having to prove something because of imposter syndrome, right? Like, no, yeah, you're right. But I guess what I'm saying is like, if your level of comfort isn't 21 days, mm. but do you feel like maybe you need to fit in or prove, you know, go have something to prove? Like, you don't have to 
Like you don't have to do that. Like you can mm. be perfectly content because your experience with whatever level of experience you have with the outdoors is just as valid as somebody who yeah. did do it for 21 days, who climbs these mountains and whatever, um, which isn't to say like, if you want to do it, do it. Because you're, to your point, I did learn a lot. I got experiences that I just would have never I would never know. I would never know the things that I know now about like what it truly means to like be an outdoors person, quote unquote, like somebody who is a back is a long-term backpacker. Like I have a unique perspective about what that's actually like that somebody who's never done it won't have. But you know, I guess don't do it before you're ready if yeah. that's not you. So while yeah. we're talking about the outdoor trip, what 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 was the thing that you learned on the trip in your experience? that that you will take forward with you not only in your personal experience in the outdoors but also in your business yeah so for my I was reflecting on this a lot while I was out there and just thinking about the way that the lack of education that probably a lot of black people have about how to navigate like natural disasters or just in the absence of like electricity or running water I mean there's so many you think about like Katrina right and how that mm -hmm. just like devastated our yeah. community I think that there's a huge opportunity for some education around just like wilderness first response and I learned a little bit about that but just like how to take care of myself and how my family can take care of ourselves like if god forbid like something did happen and we didn't have access to certain amenities like how do you get clean water right like yeah. how do you find some level of food or just like how do you communicate with people if you can't just call them on the phone like these types of things how do you how do you figure out where you are versus where you need to be like and so personally and I guess somewhat with my business but just as a person I was thinking like wow like I need my family and like people I care about should have some basic knowledge of those things like just in case something crazy ever yeah. happened and you know it's quite possible with climate change that it, it could um and i think more generally just i think that there's like from a brand standpoint a way to educate people um maybe it's in our social media posts or in our blog posts or but there's i think that there's i learned some really interesting things about just how to um like how to survive and how to manage with little and right. I always my family has managed with not a lot for a long time but this was kind of next level little like so I think that there's some I think there's some way to like share um how to use different types of resources most effectively yeah Brittany thank you for sharing uh I appreciate yeah. you giving this time and this is Ranger. Do, do.